Back in the day when I was a school teacher, I would sometimes say to my class, hey, thanks for coming. <laughs> when I'd say that, inevitably, someone would respond, Mr. Cook, we didn't have a choice. And I would maybe say something snarky like, well, yeah, you did. I mean, you could have run away screaming and you know, run down the hall, made me chase you down and try to drag you in here. You chose to walk into the classroom. It, well, maybe you agree with that, maybe not. Maybe, maybe they didn't have a choice, maybe they did. But you know, that kind of got me thinking. When it comes to the school of hard knocks, do you have a choice? Like, do, you have, do you have a choice? I mean, is that one time when it's appropriate for them to say, no, no, we didn't, we didn't have a choice? I, I think you would probably say, well, we don't have a choice whether to have the unpleasant or difficult circumstances. But we do have a choice whether to learn from it, right? Like lots of people go to the school of hard knocks and don't actually learn. They don't graduate. Um, so we don't have a choice whether or not to have the adversity, but we have the choice whether or not to graduate and get an education from it, I suppose. If you're in the school of hard knocks with Jesus as your teacher, you have a choice whether to try to drop out, right? change your circumstances with, without learning. I, that's what I mean by drop out. And you have a choice whether or not to trust God and let him be your hope. Friends, spoiler alert, I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to give up trusting God or learning the life-giving lessons he teaches. And, and I don't want you to have misplaced hope because that will let you down when you need it the most. So today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how, how to set your hope in God and how to have a perspective on suffering that will keep you from quitting. All right, that's where we're going to go. Let's go back to Paul's story. This is what we handled in part one of our little mini-series. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul wrote this, We don't want you to be un unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we'd received the sentence of death so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Paul says a bunch of stuff there, and we talked about it last week, that God went after the self-reliance that Paul and his ministry partners were demonstrating. God decided that was a big enough of a problem that God brought Paul into the school of hard knocks, and it was a very extreme edition of the school of hard knocks. What stands out to me is God didn't just remove Paul's self-reliance. God replaced it with a reliable hope. Hope that would not disappoint, not ever. Hope that would never let Paul or his companions down. It was a hope that is a reliable compass that would point Paul to the right actions, things that would truly help, things that he would not regret doing. And as a hope that would give rather than steal the resurrection power of God or the glory from God. Before we go much further, I, I, I want to do kind of a, an aside. I want to talk about what else changed in Paul. Because I said his self-reliance was, was replaced with a reliable hope. Paul learned that lesson in the School of Hard Knocks, but not only did he learn that lesson, this near-death experience that he had changed his outlook, and it changed his theology for the better. Uh, which is good for you and for me because a lot of our theology is based on Paul's writings. And so we are really glad that his theology is spot on. Murray Harris wrote a commentary and in it he pointed out this change in Paul's outlook and theology. Let me just read what Murray wrote because he said it really well. He said, this affliction in Asia, whatever its nature, affected both Paul's outlook and his theology. It forced him to abandon self-reliance and to trust in God's power. On the anvil of his experience, there had been forged a new guiding principle for life. Our competence comes from God. Paul says that in chapter 3, verse 5. So that's the first thing. Paul got a new competence, a new reason to feel competent. It wasn't competent because of his heritage and his training and his experience or anything. It was from God himself. Murray continues, also this shattering encounter with death prompted him to ponder more deeply than before the nature and the consequences of the believer's physical death. Death is the destruction of a tent dwelling and a departure from mortal embodiment. 
Death leads to the possession of a building from God and a dwelling in the presence of the Lord and an appearing before Christ's tribunal. This near-death experience got Paul, no shock here, thinking about what, what really happens when you die. And then he wrote about that for you and for me. It is we have a better understanding because God informed Paul of what happens when, he's gonna, when he dies. And Paul wrote that for us. So this near-death experience got Paul thinking about what really happens when you die. Murray continues, the other area of Paul's thought influenced by this Asian crisis and the divine verdict of death was his understanding of his own relation to the return of Jesus. For the first time, Paul began to reckon with the probability that he would die before Christ's return. And now, that's not to assert that he ever surrendered his hope of being alive when Christ returned. But for the first time, Paul came to grips with, you know what? Jesus could come back at any moment, and I was sure he would come back before the end of my lifetime, but maybe not. And as a result of that, Paul's writings shift a little bit, and he begins to tell us like, how to handle the fact that we might, we might pass before Jesus returns. Big stuff. Big change, a big lesson for Paul, right? Don't rely on yourself, but also some changes in his outlook and his theology. Now, you might hear that and go, all right, well, Paul learned an important lesson and it changed his life for the better. Hooray for Paul. Like, I'm genuinely happy for you, Paul. But what about me? And specifically, what, what if I can't figure out what the lesson is? Like, I, I'm going through it, and to me, it just feels like suffering. I, and I don't, God doesn't seem to be speaking to me and saying, Andy, you know, here, here's your problem. Or, or maybe you're in that same boat. You're like, you're going through the, this, this thing, and it feels like suffering. So it might be school of hard knocks, or it might just be suffering. It, do you believe in bad luck? Is it, is it that? What, what, if, what if God doesn't seem to say anything and I can't figure out what the lesson is or I can't figure out the thing to change so that I could graduate and be done? What do we do if we can't figure out what the lesson is if, or even if there is a lesson? That's a great question. And, 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 I, and I want to give it an answer and I'm, I'm pausing a little bit Bit because I don't want to make it sound like, oh, well, that's no big deal. No, it's a huge deal. And so while the answer is short and simple, not like easy, not cliche, shall I, we go that route? So what do we do if we can't figure out the lesson? Or what if we do if it just seems like it's suffering and it's not the hard knocks university? Well, then we lament the suffering. We, we lament the suffering. Uh, well, how do you do that, Pastor Andy? Well, this is the advice that was given to me a long time ago, and it's worked well for me, so I'm going to pass it on to you. Perhaps you've maybe heard me say it before, um, but lament. This is what you do. You, you start with the Psalms, and you start reading through the Psalms until you find a lament psalm that you can relate to. A, a lament psalm where a lot of the first part where, where the, the guy who's lamenting and he's crying out to God, it sounds a lot like what you would cry out to God. Uh, maybe the circumstances in that first part of the psalm, you're like, yeah, that's me, that's me. You know, whether it's the abuse at the hands of other people or just the, the confusion of God, why aren't you responding to anything? Or the desperate need for God to intervene and change your circumstances or the health crisis or whatever, you read through the Lament Psalms until you find one where at least the first part of it, the suffering part, the crying part, the where are you God part, or that part you can relate to. And then what I encourage you to do is when you found your Psalm, or, or the days and perhaps hours, perhaps weeks, however long it's going on, I encourage you to pray that Psalm over and over again. Maybe you personalize it, maybe you make it like first person instead of you know, in David's words or the other psalmist's words, but, but you pray it. You pray it over and over again. And you pray, you pray not just the first part, the, the God, where are you part, but the second part. Usually with all of the lament psalms except for one, there, there's a second part where, where he, he's expressing his confidence in God, his trust in God. And you pray that part. Often in the lament psalms, there's a part at the end where it's the kind of like the follow-up, it's the, it's the uh, after part where after God has delivered him. 
And so what you do is you're praying and you're praying the first part, like, God, this is where I'm at. But then you're asking God to bring the second part into your life as real and as surely as he brought the first part. So, God, I want to be, I want to give you the whole prayer, the whole psalm, not just the part like, God, where are you part? But also that, God, thank you so much. God, you rock. You have delivered me. You, all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. It all goes to you. I'm so excited. Thank you, God, part. And you, and you pray that. God, I'm praying this whole psalm, acknowledging that I can relate to the first half, praying desperately that you will bring into my life the second half. Let me give you an example of maybe how this could work. I've taken a selection from Psalm 22. And by the way, as you're going through your the book of Psalms, trying to find a lament psalm that relate to you, it, probably not every word in it or not every phrase is going to relate to you, but an idea, a, a, a big piece of it will. This is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, and I have no rest. But you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you. They trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried to you, and were set free. They trusted in you, and were not disgraced. But I'm, I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by people. Don't be far from me because distress is near and there's no one to help. I am poured out like water and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You've put me into the dust of death. But you, Lord, Don't be far away. My strength, come quickly to help me. And then there's there's this little pause and all of a sudden it changes. Right the second half of verse 21. He says, you answered me. (laughs) Yes. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. All you descendants of Israel, revere him. For he has not despised or abhorred the torment of the oppressed. He did not hide his face from him, but he listened when he cried out for help. I will give praise in the great assembly because of you. I will fulfill my vows before those who fear you. And he goes on and on for a little while. And so maybe if this is your psalm, you're like, God, yeah, all my joints are out and, I, and I'm in pain and I'm hurting and, and I cry at night because I can't sleep. But the, you, you, you don't help me sleep. And during the day, you don't seem to answer me. God, 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 this is my psalm. But I want, I want the second half. I want the part where I start shouting, you answered me and I'll proclaim your name and I will tell people your story. And, and you pray it like that. that that's an idea of what we can do. That's how we lament when we're, maybe we're in the school of hard knocks or maybe we're not. It's just suffering and we can't seem to figure it out. I hope that makes sense and I hope that's helpful. Let's jump back to Paul's story. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. Paul says, He, God, has delivered us from such a terrible death and He will deliver us. God delivered Paul and his team this time. Paul continues, We have put our hope in Him that He will deliver us again while you join in helping us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. Paul said, listen, here's what we're going to do. We have chosen to put our hope in God. We are setting our hope on God. You help. We hope you help us by praying for us that God will deliver us over and over again as many times as it takes for us to be able to do all that God has for us. So we hope you help, right? And that will result in encouragement to you and to us. We'll be encouraged to know that you're praying for us. You'll be encouraged when you see that God answers your prayers. And that's going to result in sticking with the stuff, right? And it's going to result in worship to God. And that will just be great. And that's how Paul ends this little section. So in this mini-series, we're following two themes. Hope, you just heard Paul talk about that, and hard knocks. Let's address them both as we begin our kind of our wrap up, but let's start with hope. I want to talk very practically, how do you set your hope? How do you choose to set your hope on God? Because I think that's something that we want to do. If you're a Jesus follower, you've got a new heart in it. I, I am confident 
It wants to trust God and have its hope set in God. So how do you do that? Well, setting our hope is a decision of the will carried out by the mind and body. That probably makes sense to you, right? Setting our hope, that starts with a decision. Our will decides, I am going to make God my only hope. That's the decision part. But then willpower alone doesn't do the trick, does it? No, you got to get the rest of you involved, right? By you, I mean not the others around you, although that's included. But the rest of the, you know, your mind and your emotions and your body, you've got to carry that out. You know, our, our our willpower doesn't carry out its own decisions. It it tells the body what to do, tells the mind what to do, but then the mind and the body have to do it. So, how, how do you do that? All right. Well, it starts with a decision, as I said to make God our only hope. That's got to be carried out by the mind and body. So let's talk about the body. What, what do you do? Well, you do whatever you would do if you believe that God is your only hope and a truly reliable hope. So, for example, you, you wouldn't create a backup plan or uh, like, so this is what I'll do. I, I'm trusting God. This is what I'm going to do, how I'm going to take matters into my own hands if God doesn't come through. You, you wouldn't do that. And you wouldn't hedge your bets like, okay, well, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to trust this, I'm going to trust that. You, you wouldn't do that. You, you would do whatever it was that you would do if you really believed. And I, I know it sounds like I'm being kind of vague, but it's because situations are different. But let's say that the, the school of hard knocks makes it so you just want to run away. Well, then what would you do? Well, you would stay, right? Because here's the thing that you know. You don't know if you trust until you actually act on your trust, right? You think about, and I know I've, I've used this illustration before, but you think about, you know, back in Aladdin, and, and, and Aladdin shows up there um, outside of Prince, Princess Jasmine's little place, and little place, she lives in a palace, her porch, her veranda, there we go, let's get it all nice sounding, her veranda, and he's on his magic carpet, and he says, do you want to go for a ride? And she's like, I don't know, and then he says, do you trust me? And she gets that smile because she recognizes the voice, but she doesn't really know, and he doesn't really know if she trusts him until when. She stands on the porch and says, yeah, I trust you. No, that's not it at all, right? How, how does he know? How does she know she trusts? When she stands on the railing and then steps off onto the, the magic carpet. Well, then, then you know. You and I don't know if we really are going to trust God until we, until we put some feet to it, until we actually act on it. And so we have to do whatever it is you, you would do. In the case of the silly story I just told you, you, you step off the veranda onto the magic carpet. I have no idea why I'm saying veranda in a funny way now. Eh, strike that. I don't know. Second, though, we've got to involve the mind and the emotions. And so we need to put thoughts into our head that reinforce the decision. Perhaps it's, it's just simply that. I have decided I'll follow Jesus. You know, you write it on a card, you stick it on the mirror or on a post-it note or whatever, right? But you're going to put thoughts in your mind that remind you of the decision that you've made. I am trusting God. And then, and then you need to put thoughts in your mind that are going to help lead your emotions. Thoughts that are going to help you remember that that is a good choice. It's the wise choice. It's the right choice. So, by the way, back in Psalm 22, that's, that's a way to do that. When we lament, did you notice how it does that? It, it reminds us of our decision because there, there's words in there like, I will trust you, God. I will wait for you, God. And it leads our emotions because he talks about, God, you've rescued people in the past. And you've rescued me in the past. And you're like, oh, yeah. And your emotions begin to get involved. There are other ways to do that. Music is a great way to put thoughts into our mind that remind us of the decision and that also lead our emotions, maybe stabilize our emotions. But then third, okay, so I've got my mind, my emotions kind of going in the right direction here. And I've got my body trying to do the right thing. My social my social context, my social network is the next big piece. I, I want to, if I'm going to put my hope in God, I'm going to involve my social network in helping me carry out my decision and not quit. That's what Paul did. He's like, We're, we've put our hope in God. Now, now, you guys, help me out here. Pray for us. Pray for deliverance. Pray that we'll stick with the stuff and not 
give up, right? We, we need to involve our social structures in helping us to remember our decision, carry it out, and to not quit. That's how we set our hope. It's a decision of the will that then has to be carried out, the body, the mind, and our social network. Let's talk about hard knocks, the other theme that we've been tracing through this series. The, the hard knocks perspective on suffering is where I want to wrap things up. Paul shares his perspective later in this same letter uh, to these Jesus followers, his brothers and sisters, he calls them there in Corinth. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, therefore, since we have this ministry, because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we've renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. For we're not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, we have this treasure in clay jars, so this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that Jesus' life may also be, to be displayed in our mortal flesh. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Indeed, everything is for your benefit so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You heard it. Paul's like, we're not going to give up. And we're going to set our focus where it needs to be. Because we are absolutely confident that though we are dying on the outside, we are being made into life eternal on the inside. That's a great perspective on hard knocks and on suffering, isn't it? Let me see if I can give us one that, that parallels that, but let me see if I can say it in, in simple words that hopefully I can remember. Three things. Number one, God will use pain to teach us essential life-giving lessons. Right? As you look at School of Hard Knocks, that's what, that's what stands out. God will use pain to teach us essential life-giving lessons. And it seems to me through experience and, and my own and watching other people is it seems that the pain that God is willing to use is proportional to the profit or loss of the lesson. Like the more important the lesson, the more, the more pain God will be willing to use to teach it. So God will use pain. When, when the lesson is vital enough and life-giving enough, God will use pain. He will even take us right to the edge of death to teach us those lessons. Number two, no, God is not indifferent to our pain. It's not like God's like, well, yeah, it's good for you, and I don't really care how much it hurts. God is not indifferent to our pain. Romans 8, 26 and 27 speaks about how the Spirit talks to God on our behalf when we're just so confused or so much in pain, we don't even know what to pray anymore. God is not indifferent to our pain. He is a sympathetic high priest who is listening and understanding and acting in our best interest. Number three, God will never waste pain. God will never waste pain. If you are a Jesus follower, you can't go through an experience that's only pain. 
Romans 8, 28 to 30. I know we've used this text so often. It's easy for it to become like a cliche a little bit. It's not. It's powerful. It's a promise that you and I can't go through experiences that are only pain, but instead God promises the moment you became a Jesus follower that no matter what you go through, He will twist it, turn it, do whatever it has to do in order to make that something that helps you become who you actually are in Christ. God will never, ever waste pain. It never is like, oh, wow, that hurt. I'm sorry. Well, that's all there is to it. You know, the whole point is just get through, and he did. Hooray for you. God will use pain. God is not indifferent to our pain. God will never waste our pain. Therefore, what do we do? We put our hope on God. We don't give up. I want to end this little mini-series by let's just read it together, what Paul said right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Read it with me if you would. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And you know what comes right after that? Paul begins to talk about the hope that we have in Christ, the second coming of Christ, our eternal life with Christ. And uh, that's where the second half of Pastor Joel's series is going to be. I hope you'll continue with that series in 1 Thessalonians with Pastor Joel when we get back.